Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi Ya Rabbana zidna ilma wa taqwa wa barik fi awqatina wa fi aqwalina wa fi afa'alina Laka zalamna anfusana wa na'atarif ala zambina wa ala ghafil li zhnub ila ant Wa na'udhu bika min shururi anfusina wa min shahawat wa min shubuhat Wa natlub minka ya maulana thabat ala ddin ونصلي ونسلم على الذي أرسلته بالقرآن الكريم محمد بن عبد الله عليه أفضل صلاة والتسليم أما بعد we wanted to continue the dialogue or continue the conversation that is taking place in certain segments of the Muslim community you know we're living in a moment where there's a lot of activism within the society and people are jumping in and they're trying to be involved and a lot of this is surrounding the problem of police brutality and the basically the rallying point has been Black Lives Matter and not necessarily the organization but the community and this is part of the problem that we have in the Muslim community is being able to understand subtleties of action and thought and knowing how to navigate in a political landscape which is more than just you and others in the world in other words the world is not just Muslims not Muslims you know as though the Muslim community is putting forward a model in action, in the life, in the flesh of economics, of politics, of culture. Let's not talk about Islam because it is definitely the case that we as Muslims are not representing Islam as a whole. Although we're given that responsibility in action and in reality, we're not representing Islam. Because we are living in a society in which we're participating in that political structure which is formed by that society that we live in with all of its good and all of its bad and all of its in-betweens. And it's the same thing when we talk about the economy. You know what I'm saying? We haven't built the values of the economy. We have built the economy by, by participating in it which are two different things you know they're two different things so there's a level of sophistication and meaning there's a level of understanding that a lot of times is lacking and so we hear a lot of people have opinions and that is what a democratic society without responsibility has given way to. Everyone just launches an opinion. Everyone thinks that they're a leader, an activist, you know, worthy of their opinion being heard. And it may just not be the case that our opinions weigh much, especially if there's no, you know, uh, investment and no regard for others that at the minimum, at the minimum, you know, that's not to mention the track record and everything else that comes with that. And I'm not talking about being recognized with by others that we consider giving us credentials. I'm talking about actual track record where we're involved with experience. You know, because sometimes we get we wanna be we, we wanna play the game of if our people don't recognize you, you know, and that's that's our groups, then you know, you're no one. You know, we play that game as well. If our, if our clique doesn't recognize you, you know what I'm saying, then you don't have any standing. And that's not what, you know, these types of insular games that smell of sectarianism become extremely problematic. You know, the time period requires a higher level of understanding how to navigate. And in Islamic scholarship itself, the principles are laid down for navigating situations which are gray. We know yani that al-halal al-halal bayn wal-haram bayn wa baynahuma 
with the shabby hat, if we can say it in that way, to make it simple. You know, that there are affairs that are clear and affairs that are clearly right and wrong. And then there's things that are in ambivalent. They're in the middle. They're in the gray zone. And a lot of what we live is that. Whether we like it or not, a lot of what we live is that. And un until there's power to decision make, whether at the local level or at the institutional level, a lot of times you're going to be navigating situations which you have no real control over. And so this idea, for instance, there's a lot of criticism waged against Muslim activists, if there's such a term, or the concept of social justice by people who are not really in the mix. Or some of them who they're in the mix partially. The Muslims are really nowhere to be seen on the political fronts as an organ as organizations. It's been recently that some of the orgs have come out, you know, like you have CARE operates and CARE understands its own limits and I respect them for that. And in dialogue with people, you know, and I've even mentioned, you know, if you're a single issue organization, that's not always necessarily bad from a political strategy perspective. Because it makes it simple and clear with regard to what you are dealing with. But that doesn't mean that you uphold the concept of justice for the whole of the community. And a lot of us already know that, you know. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing that mostly what CARE focuses is on Islamophobia. It's a bad thing that we as a Muslim community think that political engagement is only dealing with that. Or social justice is only dealing with those types of issues. What has been going on recently with black lives has forced the Muslims to redefine what it means to be engaged. And it has forced the hand of the Muslims, especially to deal with the situation of the African American community or the black struggle. Whereas before there was, you know, easy to just cast it to the side and just say that, well, that's not our issue. That's not really an Islamic issue. And so those who critique, I, I wouldn't even say critique, those who criticize, because critique is too lofty of a word. Critique is to offer a set of advice about a situation to make it better. You know, this is a criticism. This is an attempt to delegitimize, right, that we hear. And so a lot of the people that sit and they claim that they're defending Islam and they're the defenders of Islam and they're the keepers of tradition and they're the keepers of the deen, many of them won't come to the table and dialogue in a real dialogue outside of Muslim circles and even with Muslims who will challenge them with regard to what it is that we're actually doing to make the world a better place and so this is you know part of the issue that we suffer from like we, we're getting tired of listening to that type of rhetoric and, and from an imam's perspective and a person that's trying to be involved from my side, I'm speaking for myself. Like, you know, I challenge all of those who want to continuously take that approach to come to the table of reality. And let's sit at the table and see actually what's being done. And I mentioned this before, and this was last year, the beginning of the year. You know, there was a lot of critiques, a lot of criticisms waged against people like Linda Sarsour and others. And I mentioned, you know, what's the platform that the Muslims are offering with regard to engaging politically? What platforms? We have a couple platforms, but our platforms still need involvement. We have the Council for Social Justice, you know, which is, which is dealt with by ICNA. But how many people have come to the table to volunteer for that? We have mass pace. And there was a time when Mehdi Bray was at the forefront of that. And that was at the height of 9-11. And that was left to the side. You know, we, we had, and then we mentioned the issue about CARE and how CARE has a limited platform, but they're involved to some extent. And we used to have a lot of African-American imams that were at the forefront that were left unsupported. You know, on the political front. 
we've always had Imam Talib Abdul Rashid on the front, you know, and now he's getting older. And who has come to the forefront as far as Imams to play those types of roles? We even have Imam Jamil Al Amin Hafidhullah, who was who's incarcerated and has been incarcerated on trumped up charges. And this is something that has been pushed on a regular basis. That was the consequence of an activist that came from the Black Panther Party, became an imam, and continued to deal with the issue of justice. Where where did that go? And where was the Muslim community at? And where is the Muslim community at in regard of that? With the exception of a few people that have, you know, raised their voices in that regard, in the in the cause of Imam Jamil Al Amin. And so we have a lot of issues that, you know, when we start talking about these types of issues of social justice, like, you know, I, I often wonder, like, what it is that we're talking about? You know, what it is that we're talking about? We have Muslims that r right now we have the issue of evictions coming to the forefront and what that's going to mean. People threatened by homelessness. That's an issue that can be easily taken up by the Muslim community. This is something which in the Council for Social Justice me personally, I've been pushing this with uh, with ICNA. And it's not an org promotion issue that I'm pushing here. I'm talking about the reality of what is it that we're really doing. You know, there's too much criticism that's being waged. And there's not enough strategizing for really dealing with issues. And that issue of, of evictions that will be taking place and the threat of homelessness, that's going to affect a large portion of the society. And it's definitely going to affect a large portion of Latinos and African Americans. You know what I'm saying? And so we're not at the forefront of those issues. But we're busy, we're busy critiquing Black Lives Matter as an organization. And we're focusing on the issue of LGBT. There's a fixation with that type of stuff. As though we have the more... We, we're not at the forefront of these social issues. The best refutation that you can make of anyone, if you want to talk about a moral argument, is to be on the ground and actually stand for something institutionally and with your money. You know, we have Hassan Abdul Latif in Colorado who did like about 30, 40 years in prison. I can't remember at the moment. I know for sure it was a long haul. It was about 30 years. He came out and created one of the most successful Re-entry programs in the country In the country And it's like Where has the support been from the Muslim community With regard to that type of endeavor Right And so you know We, you know, we have to be extremely careful Of how we're dealing with issues You know People don't want to deal with the reality There's a lot of young boys And I had a conversation about this recently With people in the community one of the imams, I was talking to him about this. As a matter of fact, Imam Daniel Hernandez. We've had in the Latino community within the past two months, we've had five killings, five or six killings has been of transgender young men. And I was talking to Imam Hernandez and I was saying how we basically are having a problem in the community, you know, in the in the general Latino community, in that you know we're having young boys go to the, the transgender route and they end up murdered. Where are we at with the development of young men in general? You know what I'm saying? And that's the similar thing. And he was saying, and we have a similar problem in the African American community. You know, so we can we can talk about being against LGBT all day long, but what are we doing to guide these young boys in their struggles, in their situations? I had a case, and I won't mention a lot of details so that it won't be something that will come out in the public. I'll keep it in the general, but I had a Muslim come to me and openly tell me, I'm... I'm homosexual, but I don't practice. 
and I can't deal with the Muslim community because really they don't have anything to offer me. No, in parentheses, I'm saying it in parentheses. I don't practice, the person said. I don't practice, the person said. And I'm being pushed to the LGBT community and I don't want to go in that route. And I can't depend upon my family. And I feel suicidal. And all I have is Allah. So at the end of the day, you can sit there and you can argue all you want about your moral superiority. And about this point and that point, if you don't have any way to address people's conditions, then that's a serious problem. And I mentioned this case and I'll mention it again. I myself was confronted with this type of challenge when I worked in mental health. I had the opportunity to primarily work in the Puerto Rican Muslim and the Puerto Rican community, not Muslim community, the Puerto Rican community in Cleveland, Ohio. Although I was working in the Muslim community as well, but this job description had me working in the Puerto Rican community. And I had to take on a case. I already was, was trained in social services and we did the whole LGBT training and how to deal with that community. And, and we learned about the depression rates and the trans community and all of that type of stuff. And, and I really didn't have to deal with many cases in the social service side when I was working for the social service side. Except one case that was not labeled as LGBT or transgender or anything like that. And that was the case of the young boy within the African-American community, not Muslim, that he sexually molested his brothers. That he sexually molested his brothers, which falls within the purview of all of that type. He sexually molested his brothers and they had to be, we had to put four agencies in place to deal with that. Four different agencies, including the state, to deal with that issue. But the case that was more challenging to me was when I was dealing with the mental health issue when I had to listen to a mom cry because she was listening to she was talking about her family and how her two daughters were sexually molested by a relative and she mentioned and mind you there's a father involved you know the father and the mother were uh, are alive they were there but it was a, also another relative that did the was the perp that was the one that was responsible for that action and that was one part of the story and she and and basically the, the agency was trying to figure out what to do with her case because it had happened some time before and it had to be reported and if it was reported you know did it was it within the time frame you know and the lady was like but I'm coming to get help why am I being part prosecuted you know, if I'm coming to assist my daughter, I couldn't do anything because, you know, I was trying not to give my grandmother a heart attack and my, my husband wanted to basically almost murder my relative. That was one part of the story. The, the, the whole issue of a parent having to struggle with those types of issues and you're trying to figure out what to do and you can find yourself banging your head up against the system. And you find yourself at odds with what do you do with your family and what do you do with your child and how do you protect your child and you and your failure of not being able to protect your child although you're not responsible for the fact that someone violated your child especially if you're an involved parent that's one side of the story the other side of the story is two sisters were sexually molested and I'm in the room with the two sisters and I'm called in to deal with them at the, in the school system and they kept, they called me in because of my background, it's my community. And the young girl, the one the, the one sister says, I'm gonna protect my sister no matter what. She was getting into fights at school. She was one of the ones that was, she was one of the ones that suffered being raped. She suffered being raped. But her sexuality, the way that she continued with her sexuality wasn't necessary that she began to lean towards homosexuality, lesbianism in this case, but her sister did. And so her sister was being bullied at school. 
and her sister was su stu uh, was suffering from depression and her sister was suffering from being in a, a relationship with another girl and it didn't work out and so she was caught between being raped depression being accepted working through her identity and then being bullied at school and the bullying wasn't someone teasing the bullying was five girls wanting to whoop her butt after school on a regular basis and so I always mention this story maybe not in all of these details with this level of emotion but most of y'all wouldn't have a solution to that most of you wouldn't have a way to even deal with it. You wouldn't even touch it with a five foot, five foot pole. And so, you know, you, when you look at these situations, you know what I'm saying? The Muslim community has to grow the hell up. You know, when you look at these situations, you're not, you don't have any services. You think that this is an outside issue. You think it's an outside issue, but you don't have anything to say about the little boys that are molested when they go to study Islamic studies And if you think that it's something that is Oh it just made up We just heard about it Little boys that go to a madrasa And they get sexually molested You don't know how to deal with that issue There was a case in Ohio Where it was known that a young boy Was being molested in the home In a Muslim community Guess what That young boy Because he didn't get services Grew up to be a boy molester and the case came out in the news multiple states he was in multiple states sexually abusing young boys right there was a case of a young boy that went to egypt young african-american boy he went to egypt to go study he was memorizing quran the quran teacher sexually molested him and had porn on at the same time while he was memorizing quran and I have to scream like that because I don't know what planet some of y'all live on. And that boy, Sealeho, he distanced himself from Islam. And some of you will come and you will look at that distancing from Islam and you will judge that young boy predicated on that. And you will judge the family predicated upon that. But you will have no solution to deal with the trauma and the drama that came as a consequence to an Egyptian Quran teacher who they trusted molesting that young boy sexually and traumatizing him psychologically by exposing him to porn while he's memorizing the Quran. Do you know the psychological impact that that will have every time that that boy will approach Quran? He will remember that moment. That's a reality. You understand what I'm saying? And so when, when you guys talk about the stuff that you talk about, I'm not feeling you. And I don't care what y'all have to say, to be honest with you. Because you don't really have any solutions to real situations that are occurring on a regular, constant basis. You don't know how these situations are going to turn out. That Does that mean, does that put me in this left category, that right category? I stand on my own. I don't have to be on the right or the left. I, I'm supposed to stand on my own as a Muslim. As a human being, I'm supposed to be able to make decisions and points. So if I want to align myself with this group on this issue or that group on that issue... It's not because I may agree with them 100%. It's because I'm trying to wage a struggle on a situation. That's the bottom line. That's how it is. That's the game of politics. I didn't see you guys critiquing when Yemen made alignments, when, when Saudi Arabia made alignments to go destroy Yemen. Then you had no discussion on allies and the haramness of allies and, and making allies. And that we can go on and on with that type of stuff. And so we don't have the political sophistication as a Muslim community as it is. We don't even have these dialogues in a Muslim community, whether it's bringing services to people that have been impacted by other people's moral failings or whether it be how to engage politically. We were we're forced to talk about racism now because the society twisted our necks on it. That's the only reason why we're talking about racism. Or else many would have been comfortable with just critiquing the Muslim activists, right? The so-called Muslim activists. And the critique will come with Ilhan Omar and it will come with Linda Sarsour and that's about it. That's about it. That's where the Muslim community is at right now. And one of the brothers who, who, is, who, who, who functions periodically as an imam 
He he called to task Daniel Hakikaju over how he was bullying a sister. None of you step up on that regard. You know what I'm saying? None of you step up on the regard of how some sisters don't have any space in the masjid. You know what I'm saying? You don't step up with the issue of how still in some communities, the role of women is not the role that Islam gives to them. It's another type of cultural, backward, perverse mentality that's there. There's a lot of issues like that. You know what I'm saying? Across the board that we don't deal with properly. And we don't have any conversations on how to deal with these issues. And it remains in the realm of frustration and in the realm of passive, uh, passive aggressive responses. That's where we're at as a Muslim community. And even everything that's going on now is all reactionary. It's all reactionary. We don't give a damn about the African-American community. Let's be real with that. Let's be real with that issue. We don't give a damn about the African-American community. If we cared about the African-American community, you know, then we would be involved in those communities, investing in those communities, making sure that responsible people are there in those communities and there's funding that's going into those communities to be able for the, for, to see those communities empower and, and move the message forward. We're too busy trying to hide the fact that we're part of the destruction of the African-American community. And I'm not talking about only the African-American Muslims, right? There, there's been a mentality there and even amongst the Muslims of how we look at the non-Muslims. And I mentioned this before, Kufar. We, sometimes there's a dehumanizing aspect. So how is it that we can even bring religion into this equation if we haven't understood the humanness of others? If we haven't understood the humanness of others? And I keep mentioning this issue. Bring me something solid. I'll, I'm willing to follow, but bring me something solid. Bring me something solid with regard to what is your program on social justice. Don't talk to me about social justice warriors and you want to be on the sidelines, not involved with anything that means uplifting other people. We still have issues. And I mentioned this a couple weeks back. Imam Wesley Lebron from the Three Puerto Rican Imams Project. And some people say they tried to accuse us of being nationalists. But they don't have anything to say that, for instance, he's involved with mass. He's involved with ICNA. He's involved with other groups on the ground. He's involved with other younger, uh, older brothers, older organizations, brothers that used to be from the Dar movement. Just because we push that we want to support our people doesn't mean that we don't love you Muslims. It means that we have to have a set of priorities. And you, some of y'all have to be really careful because you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know who's married to who, what kind of blood relations are there, what kind of ties are there, what kind of investments are there emotionally and on other levels. And so, you know, there's a lot to, you know, a lot of people don't even know that Imam Wesley has an African-American son. You know, but I mentioned that point to say that, you know, there is a collaborative effort. If you, if you stand up for your people in your situation, that doesn't make you a bad nationalist. It makes you a person with priorities. It makes you a person that you know where you stand in the world. After you're doing your work on your identity in Islam, that you come back to your people like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you're willing to see how it is that you can contribute back to your people without imposing upon them. And you give them an opportunity to see what means for a person from their own community and tribe to become Muslim, that that person doesn't think that they're morally superior to, the, superior to, the, uh, to them, but they love them. And I say all of that to say that, look, even with all of these collaborations, working in our own community, in our own tribes, in the indigenous community, working in the immigrant community. When we went, the three Puerto Rican Imams Project, and this, and this point here, Imam Wesley was spearheading a food giveaway and he aligned different organizations that don't even a lot of times cooperate with each other from the Muslim community. The division is another issue. That's why we're not uh, able to achieve social justice the way that we would like. And in this case, he had a full giveaway project to the elderly. And it was successful. And Muslim orgs that would, would not have participated in that region in Jersey participated. And they came together and it was successful. And they got the local government attention that the Muslims are actually involved in doing something. And they offered, they said, we have 200 elderly. Can you guys take on this project of feeding them during this COVID-19 when they can't come outside or they're the ones that are most vulnerable? Let's say that. 
We need to serve our people. So he went back to the Muslim community. And I mentioned this before, but I mentioned it again as a support to what I was saying earlier. And when he mentioned that there was a project to feed the elderly, one of the people that's responsible in our Islamic organizations told them, and who are these people? And he told them they're elderly non-Muslims. Say, no, 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 we don't deal with the non-Muslims. We only deal with our people. So that's who, that's the type of mindset that we have in our organizations and in our psychology. That's how, that's how we deal with people. We can never have that mentality as being the leadership in Dawah. And the indigenous community needs to wake up to that. You're talking about your own relatives. You're talking about your own cousin. So what if you have a problem with your, with your cousin Jimmy who's on crack or your auntie Barbara who's an alcoholic? You know, the, and you may not be able to deal with them, but you're not allowed to dehumanize them. You're not allowed to dehumanize them. You give me a proof in the Quran and the Sunnah that says you can dehumanize them. Give me an actual example from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says you can dehumanize them. People have a lot of these things twisted. Just because personally I may talk about white supremacy and I'm taking responsibility for what I say. That doesn't mean that I'm against European Americans. I don't even like using the term white. I think it deprives European Americans from their Irish background, their German background, their British, British background, their Nordic background. Whiteness, what does that mean? That was something that was created, you know, as a concept. And so we get all of these situations twisted because we don't have solid discussions. Issues of racism, issues of how we deal with our communities, issues of how we deal with the society. And I keep mentioning this over and over again, hoping that the Muslim community takes this stuff serious enough that we begin to have real conversations about what is our role in the society that we live in and towards other human beings. Because we can't expect that Muslims from overseas that are stuck on tribalism, and I'm not talking about immigrant Muslims, I'm talking about what goes on overseas. Because many immigrant Muslims come here and they don't want to be associated with the garbage that goes on overseas. You take some places in the Muslim world over disagreements, they blow each other up on Yom al-Juma. That's not a representation of Islam, right? You take, you have whole countries destroying themselves. You have a humanitarian crisis that is a consequence of Muslims or people associated to Islam making decisions on a political level, which has led to a humanitarian disaster. We have, and it's not just the involvement of the Americans, because at a certain point, there has to be a choice that's made to say, you know what, we're going to align ourselves with this type of policy. There's also an issue of saying, no, we don't want this. So you can't just blame the American system 100% on everything. Although I'm for a radical critique of the American system. But that doesn't go because that type of, you know, that type of problem, you know, is another type of issue that we're dealing with. People have to take responsibility at the same time as well. We can critique the system and so on and so forth. But we're talking about sovereign countries. You know what I'm saying? And so they have to learn how to play out their sovereignty. They can easily come out and scream to the people and say, we will not accept this injustice, oh people, let's stand up for justice. And that's not where they're at. So they play along with the game. You understand what I'm saying? So I want to end on that note that's saying that, look, we need to stop these debates about critiquing people that are involved in social justice and the Muslim activists and that Muslims are not being activists. Let's, let's, be, let's be real with that. Muslims are not on the ground except a few individuals. As institutions, we're not on the ground. So the concept of Muslim activists, let's cut that out. People may call themselves Muslim activists. If you want to use Linda Sarsour as an example of critiquing her, you know, you didn't give her a platform on Muslims to be able to engage in that Muslim activist that you claim is the right way of a Muslim engaging activism. What platforms do Muslims have in reality? And I mentioned that earlier in the live, and I don't want to keep going in circles with this, but we need to be fair. We need to do some self-criticism. We need to do some muhasab at the nafs, right? We, we need to take ourselves to account because this is not right. And like I said, we have a few Muslim platforms. I'll, I'll name the three. At the forefront, there's a lot of smaller ones. You know what I'm saying? How many of us got behind Muslim Ark, the anti-racism initiative? And I didn't mention that earlier. How many of us got involved with, uh, with PACE, Mass PACE, as, as a, a, a social justice organization? How many of us got involved with 
Council of Social Justice by ICNA. How many of us created another organization, right, to be involved in these issues? And we mentioned care for the longest has been a, a basically a singular line issue. And I mentioned how, you know, it was the Muslim community decided not to deal with the issue of racism. They decided solely to focus on discrimination. And if you read the paper by SPU on the on Islamophobia and the elections, I advise you to read it. I advise you to sit back and read it so you can see where where thinking was in the Muslim community that was academic. They decided not to deal with racism. So that means you decided not to deal with what was impacting a, a good portion of, of converts in the Muslim community. You decided to say that the Muslim community, the only issue that we want to deal with is Islamophobia. When it's like many people that were suffering Islamophobia, it, you know, we can say that they're in one small group. You know, there is not that's not representative of the whole of the Muslim community as a, as a, uh, as a whole. And so there was that intentional saying that we're not going to deal with this type of issue. We're not going to deal with the Islam. We're not going to deal with the racism. Right. And so there's a lot of issues of that's how we function. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a class battle. It's a battle of interest. It's a battle of those who just want to settle themselves. And as long as we have that type of approach and leadership, it's not going to go anywhere. But we need to stop this crit criticism of the Muslim activists. And the ones that are waging it, many of the time, they're the least active in the community. And the ones that are active, you need to be mindful of yourself. You need to be mindful of yourself and you need, to, you need to be honest. You need to be honest that to really be involved is difficult. To really be involved in activism and community organizing is difficult. It's challenging because you have to deal with people that don't agree with you. You have to deal with different situations. You have to deal with different philosophies, different ideologies. You have to deal with different interests. And if you're not ready to face that as a reality, then why are you talking about being an activist? Because then that means that you are really not talking about what it means to really be an activist. If you're an activist in housing, do you think that you're going to have to deal with just one group of people and it's all going to be clean? You're going to have to deal with a number of different groups. If you want to be an activist at the political level and go into Congress, do you think that your constituency is only the Muslim community? Do you think that in, the, in this democracy, republic, democracy, whatever it is that you want to characterize it as, as do you think it's only going to be one group of people that agrees with you? And that's where the Muslims are. It's a bubble world, a bubble life. You, you understand what I'm saying? If you want to be a community activist, like, for instance, some of the imams in the past in today's time, do you think that you're just going to go into a neighborhood and clean up? You don't think you're going to be met with opposition? from gentrifying forces, from drug dealers, from those pol corrupt politicians. You don't think that there's going to be forces that are going to stop you from actually cleaning up a community? From from removing that community, you're going to be, you know, you're going to have to slam up with community control boards, controlled by puppet leaders who are really protecting the interests of corporations and others. So let's get it together. If we're talk, if we're going to talk about what it means to be a Muslim activist, let's talk about what it means to be an activist across the board in American society, in the U.S. society. Let's talk about the challenges of being involved in politics. Let's talk about the challenges of dealing with different groups that you may not agree with and why they exist and where it is that we have gaps in our services and so on and so forth. But this is whack at this point to con cons consistently and constantly just hear the only criticism that Muslims have. Of uh, for instance, being involved in this situation where we're trying to deal with the anti-racism, you're bringing up Black Lives Matters, and you're bringing us right back to your debate with the LGBT community, which many of you don't even have a relationship with them. And some of you have these types of people in your families, and you don't even know how to deal with them. And it's across the board. It's not only within the Latino community and the African American community and the European American community. This is also among... Look, there was an Arab young guy who went to a latino club and he was muslim and was actually predominantly a, Poli a puerto rican a lgbt club not muslim in florida and he was the one that uh, perpetuated an act of violence in that club and when and the three puerto rican imams went to puerto rico to do work to bring aid Don maria 
a representative of the LGBT community from that club area went to Puerto Rico to try to make a bridge with us because of what had happened, because of what that Arab Muslim did, or he claimed to be Muslim. And actually they say his wife, who was Muslim, even supported him in that and knew that he had a sexuality problem. And you can look up the case, it's all public. And so let's not act like this is not in the community. You know what I'm saying? And so when it gets to that point that you have these people going into clubs and, and they're participating in that activity, you have no services for them. You have no way to address it. That becomes a, a, a deep problem that, you know, that, and so it's not, it's not our problem to take on a philosophy of a community that is still doesn't want to take responsibility for its own history and direction. And that's what I leave on. We should, we should, we should accept more from the Muslim. We should not accept less. We should demand more from the Muslim community. We should demand excellence on on leadership levels. We should demand excellent excellence on follower followership levels on our institutional levels. We should demand to be in, involved. But we can't continue with this. This is whack. This constant criticism that we wage towards each other without any sort. It's not a critique. And I mentioned the critique is you bring. A critical analysis of how to make something better. That's what we need. We don't just need to sit there and criticize each other on a constant basis. And like I said, you know, what kind of Muslim activists are we talking about? The Muslims are not involved. That's why people are aligning themselves with all kinds of different groups. They're trying to learn how to be involved. And they're learning about the problems that come along with that. And I'll tell you because I myself am going through those types of experiences. It's not easy. You have to learn how to navigate. I just don't put it out there 100%, but you have to learn how to navigate. It's not easy. So those who have said, you know what, I'm going to just be out there 100%, you know, I have a regard for them because I know that they're taking up the challenge and I know the difficulty that they're experiencing. But the Muslims are not involved. And so because you're not involved, you don't have the right to be, you don't have the right to critique. You know what I'm saying? Because you're not going full throttle. And you're not super committed. You don't have the right to criticism. And you're, you're sticking in your own little corner without having real solutions. You don't have the right to criticism. When you're ready to step on the step to the table and have honest dialogues about how to better this situation, about really what it means to be an activist in society and how the Muslims can get involved. And, and when you're involved, when you when you get ready to either form your own platform or to inject yourself in other platforms that are already existing, then let's have a real conversation. But to label ilm talking from traditional texts that have that don't do anything in the community at all or organizations that are single oriented organizations and you really are not involved on the ground to be to be let's let's be honest you you guys you know this is you're you're contributing to chaos in this situation yeah what you, what you should do is say let's have a conference and let's try to do a study a series of studies of how it is that we can be involved and get the get the, the backing, the economic backing for that. Let's bring the top activists. Let's bring the old school imams. Let's bring the top activists, whether we agree with them or not. And let's see what kind of models of activism are there. Let's see what organizations are there on the ground. What are the issues that they're dealing with on the community level, on the political level, on the social level? Let, let's be real about it. If not, we're not. If not, we're not being real. But it's tiring to hear people just sit and critique and 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 and, uh, and, and wage their, their their tirades. But in reality, they don't want to be part of the solution. And we can't be part of the solution if we don't understand the problem correctly. Assalamu alaikum.